everybody. Thank you so much for coming tonight. This is our second uh, Mapping Your Future event, as Gwyneth said. We're really excited to be here. I'm really excited to be here. And thank you so much to the Humanities Initiative for graciously hosting this event. We really appreciate it. Um, I, as well as my colleague and friend Thomas Collins, are here on behalf of the NYU Humanities Ambassadors. Um, in 2014, we formed under the Humanities Initiative as a student-run organization with the mission of strengthening the voice and identity of the humanities undergraduate community here at NYU. There are many pre-professional societies here like pre-law, pre-med, but we really felt that there wasn't a community in place for the humanities. We felt compelled to create a space for humanities students and people maybe studying different fields who enjoy and appreciate the humanities nonetheless, um, a place for them to come together to collaborate and to give the humanities here at NYU a face and a presence. Together we hosted a number of events for the greater community, our most successful of which was this one, Mapping Your Future, which we held in April of last year. And this semester we were changed focus a little bit and with the generous support and guidance of the Humanities Initiative, we founded a publication called Field Notes. We wanted to demonstrate the value of a humanities education for the development of different professional skills and to show how the humanities can really transcend the academy in helping us answer the most pressing questions of the human experience. To do so, we reached out to individuals doing compelling work within their fields and we asked them to address how the humanities inform that work. Field Notes is their response. It features essays, poems, interviews, and images, and in its entirety, it serves as a collection of notes from many different fields. We're really excited to share it with everybody, and we'll be handing out copies at the end. If you haven't grabbed one already, please feel free to do so, and we'll be happy to give them to our panelists here tonight as well. Um, so our hope with Field Notes was really that conversations with the thinkers and the seers and the doers of the humanities would facilitate dialogue among individuals across academic and professional specializations. Ultimately, we hope that that really enriches the creative output produced by us all. That's really the idea behind tonight, too. Um, on that note, I'd like to thank our panelists again for coming. They can tell us how the humanities play a part in their stories and the exciting work that they're doing today in their own fields. All right, well, thank you so much. It's great to be here. Um, as both mentioned, my name is Raina Ben. I graduated from NYU Gallatin in 2009. Uh, my concentration was in international communications. And right now, I'm actually a senior account executive at Abernathy McGregor, which is a strategic communications firm. I know strategic communications sounds kind of vague. And I got to say, even a lot of people coming right out of school that join our firm are not 100% sure exactly of what it is we do. But uh, to just give a really general overview, uh, what, my, what I do and what my firm does is we help companies really communicate their story and their message to the audiences that are most important to them, especially during times of change. So a lot of times a company might be going through, um, you know, they're, they're thinking of going public, they're having a management change, maybe. Uh, you know, they're acquiring company or they themselves are being sold. You know, there's always some type of, um, you know, big change in the company. And this is something that you might see a lot in the newspapers. And you might think, you know, who is really impacted by this? And that's the company's main audience. And that's who we're specifically speaking to. It's, you know, their employees, their um, customers, their, you know, business partners or, um, you know, their shareholders, and it's a variety of audiences that are really, um, you know, invested in that and uh, really impacted by that. So, um, you know, what I do specifically has, is a range of, um, you know, crisis communications, like we've dealt with companies that are going through a data breach. We've, um, you know, helped a small tech startup that's you know, about to go public and making that transition. Um, we've even done, like, perception, perception studies of investors and what they're thinking of a you know management strategy, and uh, you know how that will impact the company, um, and just that's really just a very general overview. But one thing to keep in mind is actually everyone at my company all has completely different backgrounds. So there are people who have English majors, um, journalism majors, uh, history, public policy, or political science. It really runs the gamut, and I think what 
we what the skills that we utilize a lot, um, you know, at our firm, which are you know our analytical skills and a lot of writing, a lot of research. Those are all skills that are really based in um, you know our humanities backgrounds. Um, I specifically at Gallatin, like I mentioned, I studied international communications, and my con we did a colloquium. So mine was on globalization and international um, studies and cultural identity. And when I was first at NYU, I had an idea of what interested me. I didn't know exactly what form that would take afterwards, but I was really interested in uh, globalization and writing and cross-cultural communication. And I, Gallatin really allowed me to take classes in Steinhardt and CES and really explore all those different facets. So really tried to take advantage of that in addition to the um, Gallatin interdisciplinary classes that I took, which I really loved. And at NYU, I also studied abroad in uh, Shanghai uh, for a semester, which was a really great experience as well and really opened my eyes a lot. Um, in terms of how I got to what I'm doing right now, I mean, right after school, I had done a series of different internships. And I had focused on public relations, but didn't really quite find my niche. I had first uh, started a public relations company that did more event planning. And to me, that, at least personally, was, didn't quite suit um, my particular skills and interests. And I really wanted something that um, would incorporate you know, the writing skills and working a lot with people, but also had a little bit more of, of an impact. And that's where I fell into uh, strategic communications. I feel like it's a really good combination of all those different skills, especially, um, like I mentioned, a lot of the writing and research and be collaborating a lot in the small teams. And those are all you know, really things that interest me and really strong skill set, at least that I got from NYU. Hi, everybody. Um, so I, I have a BA in English, uh, and I have a confession, um, which is uh, a couple of uh, weeks ago, my cousin's uh, daughter called me um, because her father uh, told me, told her to, and, and uh, she said, I want to change my major to English. And I said, why would you want to do that? And so we get into this, you know, sometimes we get into this defensive posture. Well, it was, she's coming from science. And, I, you know, of course I try to tell her to stay in science and she should, said she didn't want to do it. We have a lot of teachers in our family. Um, for me, both sides of my family, but um, the, the family that we share, it has a lot of teachers in it. And we all complain about teaching and we all complain about those kinds of responsibilities and complain about recent federal policies. And uh, she said, I don't care, right? I, that's what I really want to do. I don't know any different, and it's going to be fine. And I said, OK, um, I, you know, we, you certainly have good company, right? Your, your uh, family has a lot of people like that. So it's, it's hard to um, sometimes commit, right? It's, and when I think back on my path, I don't think I ever really committed to the humanities. I think it's a really of a strange thing. Like, I started out in engineering and um, got to physics and I had a bad physics teacher and I didn't, was in a bad mood and I fell in love and I said, forget it, I'm not doing this anymore, I'm gonna go read books. And um, I did a lot of literary theory, uh, which um, I really appreciated, uh, and I did a lot of journalism. So I had a lot of practical work uh, in like making newspapers with uh, desktop publishing and learning how to punctuate sentences really well. And I did a lot of reading about like why do we have literature and what does literature mean? And uh, that has taken me on a, a very uh, strange path. I don't ever regret the changes that I made, but I never would have predicted them. Uh, came to New York City to do a, a master's degree with the intention of going on for a PhD because I wasn't such a strong uh, candidate that I could get right into a master or a PhD program, but master's programs were happy to take me. And uh, did a master's. Uh, with a American studies focus, but definitely kind of lit heavy, and then went on for a, a PhD in English um, from there. While I was doing that, I was working. Uh, a lot of people, my friends, were taking out loans. Uh, I was working full time for a consulting firm, and as you're saying, there's you know tons of people with you know bachelor's degrees in business, uh, and then there's in my my firm there was somebody who was an electrical engineer and somebody who was a French literature major. And they do have these, you know, business people do need uh, people who are just really good thinkers. And it doesn't mean that you have to have a business degree to do so. So I was in the, um, the document shop, worked in uh, editing, uh, paid my way through grad school, um, which was nice because I didn't have a lot of loans. And, you, you know, you're not going to make a ton of money as an academic in, in, with a humanities degree. 
uh, and um, stayed true to my intention, which was to you know learn about science and its interactions with literature. And I've been grateful that my literary theory background paid off because science studies is very much influenced by literary theory. And uh, now today, um, after another series of misadventures, which I'm not going to bore you with, I ended up at the College of uh, oh, the School of Engineering now, which was, used to be at a separate uh, university. And my job is to help his engineers think about well, how they could be better engineers with knowledge of history and literature, right? Every time they make a proposal or every time they uh, apply for a patent, they are doing something uh, in the humanities, right? They're making a historical argument. They're making a rhetorical argument. And they want to be innovators and they want to break free of these um, paths uh, that others have set. And they need historical argument. They need uh, rhetorical argument. And so for me, that's been a really uh, an enriching way of using the humanities uh, to uh, make people think a little bit more openly and be more uh, innovative. And I've uh, been really uh, blessed for the, the last few years that we've been able to even have a program in science technology studies, uh, which uh, now today is one of the cross-school minors and something that uh, students use uh, as a pre-professional degree for um, law or uh, medicine. Hi, um, I'm April Hathcock. I am the scholarly communications librarian here at NYU. Um, I get to work with scholars like you, like your professors, on issues relating to ownership and rights and access to scholarly material. Um, so both the materials that you create as a scholar and also the things uh, that you use. Uh, but originally, I was trained as a lawyer. Um, after undergrad, I uh, went and got my JD and my Master's of Law from Duke, um, and specializing in international comparative law. And then, like most people from Duke, I went to uh, go work at a very, very, very large uh, law firm uh, based out of Los Angeles and realized that I have also, like most people um, in, who interned to the law, I realized I don't like doing that. I hate it. Um, and so I ended up leaving that and deciding to go into librarianship. So I went back to school to get my library degree. And now here I am at NYU um, doing what I do just at the intersection of the law and um, in scholarship and academia and libraries. And I absolutely love it. Um, but before all of that, I was a French major. Um, I was absolutely obsessed with Renaissance, and still am, with Renaissance French literature. Um, the body tales of Rabelais just get me going. I love it. Uh, Voltaire is one of my favorites, who he also trained as a lawyer and decided he did not want to do that and became the writer that we all know and love today. Um, so I'm very much a humanist at heart, um, you know, and I was also fortunate enough in addition to my major, I went to a small liberal arts college. Um, I actually didn't go to NYU. And so in most liberal arts colleges, the main focus, regardless of your major, is in humanities uh, work, humanities inquiry, and scholarship. And so what that means is that they really emphasize teaching us how to read, how to write, how to think critically. And to me, that really sort of lays at the heart of what humanistic studies get you. Um, you know, the, when you think about the sciences and the social sciences, you know, they always, they work with their data. It's like things that they, they can observe, that they can quantify, um, they analyze it, and, you know, they communicate it. Um, and in the humanities, we also have our data, but our data are ideas, they're concepts, they're, um, you know, even it could be as simple as just musings or ponderings. Um, and what we do is we gather that data as well, we gather those ideas, and we synthesize them, and we reduce them to our, their essential elements. Um, and then we combine them in new ways to create new arguments, to create new ideas, to create new concepts. And that whole process um, is not innate. It's not something we're born knowing how to do. It's a skill that you have to develop, and you develop that in humanities training. And it's actually something that has been a huge part of my work, both as a private attorney and also now as a sort of librarian slash lawyer. Um, because my work involves taking a lot of complex concepts and con um, ideas um, and bringing them together and sort of synthesizing them and communicating them to a wide variety of audiences. Uh, so it could be something as simple as sitting down with a faculty member who's getting ready to sign a publication agreement for a new book and helping them go through that agreement and figure out, you know, do I get to keep my copyright? Do, am I signing it away? What, am I going to be able to send a free copy of my book to my grandmother? Or, you know, questions, very simple, practical questions like that. Um, it could be a matter of sitting down with the student and talking to them about the things that they can and can't do with materials they get out of a database. You know, students want to know, well, I got this picture out of art store. Why can't I post it on a public website? Like, what's the problem with that? 
So talking to them about that and explaining to them what the legal ramifications are of that are. Um, or it could be just working with my fellow librarians on um, you know, incredible collections that they found that they want to acquire and they want to know what they can do with them. Um, I have a colleague I just met with last week who is going to be getting a series of films from um, the National Museum of American Indians um, from a film festival that they've run since the 80s. And it's all kinds of um, original films by American Indian filmmakers that we want to take here at NYU and post them online. And so I'm working with her to figure out, okay, how do we reach out to these filmmakers um, res for, with respect for their creations and respect for them as creators and as indigenous creators um, and still be able to do what we want to do here at NYU, which is preserve their work and make it available to scholars and students everywhere. Um, so my, my work really ranges the gamut, um, but it is very much at this intersection of libraries and the law and it's about taking those ideas, that data that we use in the humanities, um, and clarifying it and distilling it and communicating it to all these different audiences. And um, I'd really be happy to talk to you more about what I do and, and the, you know, how my uh, you know, past has sort of helped me lead me to this point. So it's been a kind of a wandering path, but definitely uh, the common thread has been that, that humanities, uh, those skills that I learned in humanities. My career path started when I was 18 years old and I enlisted in the Army National Guard. Shortly thereafter, I uh, started my freshman year at Illinois State University in the middle of nowhere in a town called Normal, <laughs> Illinois. And um, I knew that I liked history, it was fun, so that's what I, those were my initial classes. And I was studying and reading and writing about the history of segregation in Chicago and decided that I wanted to be a teacher in Chicago. And after my freshman year, I deployed to Afghanistan for 10 months. And being a history major, I couldn't resist reading about the history of Afghanistan and the history of, uh, of warfare. And when you read about the history of warfare, it leads you to uh, Lao Tzu, who influenced uh, the art of war. And um, so I was reading about history, I was reading about religion while I was deployed. I was also reading about community organizing because being interested in segregation in Chicago uh, caused me to be interested in civil disobedience and community organizing. And after reading about reading all these different things, uh, I began to be critical about, about war and uh, became a, a war resistor. I came home from Afghanistan and four days later was back in the classroom my sophomore year at, at Illinois State. And I started reading even more about the Chicago Freedom Movement, which was Martin Luther King's campaign to desegregate Chicago. And that inspired me to be a community organizer. So I took a break from school. I took a year off from college, started studying community organizing and social movement building around the country at different uh, organizations. and decided to switch schools, and I became both a history major and a sociology major because I wanted to understand power and social change and social forces. And, and I also uh, applied for conscientious objector status from the military, which is a, a, uh, it's a process to leave the military on the basis of a, having a change in conscience. And that process got me even more interested in philosophy. And so I sort of used philosophy uh, in a great deal in, in, how I, in how I pursued my sociological studies. And, and it, it, I continued to, to learn about community organizing as a, as a history major at University of Maryland. And, um, and, and, so, and so, sort of the, in general, I think being a history major um, it gave me this, these skills to be able to think about history critically, uh, to be able to think about stories and narratives critically, to be able to think about symbols and, and ideas critically, and to be critical of sources of, inf uh, sources of information and to see how different people can have such diverse perspectives about the same exact reality. And these were all really important um, skills that caused me to have so many changes in how I viewed war and how I viewed my own career. 
I've done all sorts of different things. And it just what I do sort of depends on what I'm interested in at any given moment in time. So I've, I've been a community organizer with Iraq Veterans Against the War, served on their national board of directors. I've been a campaign director with Vote Vets. I've interned on Capitol Hill. I've also been a policy analyst at the Administration for Children and Families, um, sort of working on the on working on programs related to subsidized employment and also the uh, the immigration crisis last summer when there was a huge surge in unaccompanied immigrant minors, and so. Again, sort of what I do sort of depends on, on, on what I'm interested in. And now I'm back in school. I'm complementing my humanities studies with, with something that I think would help me uh, figure out how to develop organizations so I can be paid to do what I love. And I'm studying military, uh, uh, public administration at NYU Wagner. And um, I'm happy to speak more uh, when we break out into our different groups. I work as the Child Protection Team Leader at the UN Department of Peacekeeping Operations. That's the UN agency that sends out peacekeeping troops to conflict areas. And I work on the protection of child soldiers. Um, we call it child protection or protection of children affected by armed conflict. Uh, today, there are 18 peacekeeping missions in the world. Seven of those missions have mandates to protect children affected by armed conflict. And my job is to provide technical support to those seven missions. So I do everything from training of troops to training of child protection staff to providing technical support on the separation of children from those armed forces or armed groups. Uh, before joining DPKO, I did the same kind of work for about 10 years, except that I did it with humanitarian organizations instead of peacekeeping operations. So that means that I worked in Eastern Chad with UNICEF and with UNHCR, which is the UN Agency for Refugees. I worked in the Central African Republic with the Nor Norwegian Refugee Council. I worked in Geneva with the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center. And I worked here in New York with the New York Bar Association. Regarding my career path, uh, it has not been a straight traditional road. It has also been a wandering road like some of my colleagues here. Um, I ended up working on the protection of children affected by armed conflict because of a series of circumstances. It wasn't something that I planned. Uh, I, after I got my undergraduate degree, I pursued cultural studies for several years. Um, and I worked at the Modern Language Association and at cultural venues like the Museum of Modern Art. And I eventually pursued a PhD in comparative literature, which I did not finish because of September 11th. So I was here in New York when September 11th happened, and I decided to change careers in my mid-30s. My family almost had a heart attack because <laughs> I had invested heavily in an academic career, and I decided to give it up to do something that had more of an impact on the lives of people instead of teaching literature. Uh, after September 11th, the city of New York really changed, as did the rest of this country. Um, and suddenly, programs like special registration were put in place. I'm not sure if you are familiar with those programs. But special registration is a program where, where Arab men between the ages of 18 and 32 in the United States had to register with immigration services after September 11th. And this was regardless of their immigration status. And as a result of that program, more than 80,000 people were deported from this country. And um, Arab and Muslim communities were targeted in New York. So as a result of that, I realized that teaching literature is not what I wanted to do, that I wanted my work to have more of an impact and to be more directly involved with, especially with immigrants. I'm an immigrant myself, so I wanted to be involved with people who were going through these kinds of, of issues. Uh, when I first left the, my academic career, I thought that I should go to law school and get a degree in human rights law. And um, I was really lucky to be able to talk to the director <clears throat> of the Bar Association at the time. Um, she really changed my life, and she kept me from going to law school. <laughs> <laughs> she told me that I already had a lot of education under my belt, and that by studying humanities, I had transferable skills that I could use for this career change. So for example, I was a researcher. I had been doing an, a PhD program. And I also speak four languages, so I could do translation. And that these sorts of, I could use these sort of skills to embark in a humanitarian career, or humanitarian affairs um, career. 
So what happened is I started volunteering for about six months. I gave up an academic career. I started volunteering at the New York Bar Association. They have something called the City Bar Justice Program, which is a program that provides free legal services for asylum seekers. And um, I worked with them for about as a volunteer for about six months. What I did is I started out translating for asylum seekers in their sessions with psychiatrists and with and in immigration court. Many asylum seekers were victims of torture in their own countries, so they needed to go through these um, through these psychiatric sessions for their asylum cases. And because I had research skills, I was trained to do what's called country conditions research, which is to figure out if asylum cases are viable. Um, I did that for about four years and really loved it and realized that that was the path I wanted to take. Uh, after four years, I decided that I wanted to do field work. So to see um, firsthand the refugee crises and, and conflict situations where refugees were fleeing and coming to the US. Uh, and that's how I got my first job in Chad, working on the border with Darfur with UNHCR. Um, fast forward 10 years and I'm now working in peacekeeping operations. And I'd be happy to continue to talk to you about this circuitous path um, and how a humanities degree led me to this path. Thank you. My name is Peter Mendelson, as it says on the card there. Uh, I was a BA in philosophy at Columbia University. I studied philosophy, but I, a lot of my time was spent in literature classes as well. Columbia also has this uh, vaunted uh, core curriculum where you sort of have to take uh, a whole mess of classes, um, whether you want to or not. Um, and I ended up with a very broad uh, humanities uh, degree from there, although my thesis was in philosophy. Um, I should also say that before I went to Columbia, basically from the time I was four on, I've been uh, playing the piano. Uh, I was a classical pianist for most of my life, and I sort of always assumed that's what I was going to be. And when I graduated from high school, I remember thinking, oh, the natural thing is I'm going to go to a conservatory. And uh, that was what I was destined to do. Uh, and my father sat me down and he said over my dead body. <laughs> and I, I think his point was not just, well, if the piano thing doesn't work out, you need to have other options, and fair enough. Um, there were certain skills he wanted me to have, you know, a lot of which have already been addressed by my extremely impressive fellow panelists. You guys are ridiculously <laughs> amazing. <laughs> um, you know, critical thinking, uh, being able to advocate for your critical thinking, uh, being able to write well, all of these skills that have actually, I'll get to this in a minute, but proven extremely useful in terms of the job that I have now. Um, so uh, I played all the way through Columbia, and I didn't get any academic credit for it, but while I was in school, I was also at Manhattan School of Music working as an accompanist and using their practice rooms and trying to make money. Um, and then I graduated, and I went to graduate school at a conservatory, which was, I figured, my due at that point. My father couldn't intervene anymore. Um, and then my first daughter was born, and my wife and I needed health insurance. And, well, that was the brick wall that my father had foreseen. And, I mean, it could have gone differently, but that's the way it went. And so my wife and I sat down on the floor of our living room and had that kind of Seinfeldian conversation about other things that Peter likes to do other than play the piano, which was a very small set of things, you know, watch <laughs> soccer games. Um, so at one point, my brilliant wife said, well, you know, you love to draw. And that's true. I do love to draw. And I had done a little bit of design work over the years, like I had designed our wedding invitation and, you know, t-shirts for friends and bands and that sort of stuff. But it always seemed like kind of a humorous sideline. She, she said to me, you know, why don't you consider the field of design? And I thought about it and I thought, okay, how hard could that be? Especially compared to, you know, I, I was at a conservatory with these extremely motivated crypto autistic kids who had been playing, uh, doing nothing but play music for 10 hours a day by themselves. I, I, you know, so I had come from a pretty difficult career. I thought design couldn't be that difficult. So I went to the local bookstores and got a bunch of books on sort of, you know, how to design. And then just volunteered my services for free to a bunch of places, including recording studios where I recorded as a pianist, um, making CD covers. And within about six to nine months after I had decided to leave the piano, I had a portfolio. And um, I'm probably well over five minutes at this point. 
I promised I'd be really pithy. I'm sorry about this. <laughs> anyway, um, my first job interview, which came through a friend of my mother's friend whose partner had a Scrabble partner who was this guy named Chip Kidd, who was a book cover designer. <laughs> I know. And uh, so he's a book cover designer, and I thought, well, this is a ridiculous job. It's pretty frivolous um, as jobs go. Looking at you guys over there. <laughs> peacekeeper and veteran, et cetera. Um, and, but I went to the interview, and I showed him my book, and he looked at it, and he's like, well, you have a skill for this. And the thing that really got my attention during that meeting with this guy were the books on his shelves. And as someone who got a liberal arts degree, I not just that I had been trained as a reader, but I had been trained to love reading and love deep reading and critical reading, and I kept that up, and I've always been a very avid reader, and you know, seeing the Knopf authors, he was at Knopf, uh, whose books he had worked on, I was just totally thrilled. And, and actually, I should probably say, because this is the one thing that probably hasn't been addressed in terms of the use of a liberal arts education, I sort of had the patois down, right? Like, I knew the lingo. I could say the things that one says, the sort of secret Masonic hand signals that one uses to show that one has a broad liberal arts background. And actually, that really helped me get my foot in the door. Anyway, I was hired. I started working a week later. I've been in that job 12 years. Uh, I'm a book jacket designer at Knopf. I've designed thousands of book jackets, everything from like The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo to, you know, Sheryl Sandberg's book. I've worked with Supreme Court justices, presidents, rock stars. It's fun. It's a great job. It's a ridiculous job, but I love it. Um, this past year, I wrote two books of my own um, that came out this August. One is a design book, a, work of, a book of my own work uh, and essays that I wrote about design. And another one, in a weird return to philosophy, is a phenomenology of the reading experience. It's called What We See When We Read, and it's a book about how the reading experience feels, sort of as opposed to the metaphors that we use to describe it commonly. Um, and. I also do a ton of editorial illustration work for the New York Times op-ed page. Um, just today, New Yorker cover on Baltimore came out. Just saw this on the newsstand on the way over. Um, so anyway, weird U-turn for me. Um, happy to talk about any of that further. Uh, I'd be nowhere without my liberal arts degree. Honestly, nowhere. Thanks, Dad. Um, <laughs> But I mean that, and I can, I can drill down with you guys when we get to the tables. 